long today for peace in our hearts and in our lives. May the world be filled with the peace of Christ. May our worship now begin. Today we light two candles, the candle of hope and the candle of peace. The light of the second candle reminds us that God's purpose in sending his son into the world was to bring peace. We look at the division, the fighting, and the turmoil around us, and we see a world of dire need. We remind ourselves that peace begins with forgiveness, and that forgiveness begins in our hearts. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we thank you for your promise of peace, and we know that because of Christ, peace is possible. We pray today for the nations of the world that we could find a way to live together in peace. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the work, that we could become more forgiving, more understanding, and more loving one another. Flood our hearts with the light of peace today so that we so that we might take that light and spread your love to the whole world. Amen.
from Isaiah 40 instead of 10 that is printed in your bulletin. Verses 3 through 5. This reading can be found on pages 619, I hope, of your Bible. <laughs> Listen now to the reading of the scripture. A voice cries, and the wilderness prepares the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level, and rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and is found on pages 836 and 837 of your Pew Bible. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this he is who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. <clears throat> Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and leather, a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then he went out to Jerusalem and all Judea and all of the region about the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit that benefits repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to rise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of these trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. We will now sing one verse of Jesus loves me as he comes forward. Thank <laughs> And 
send out Christmas cards. Do we have to do that to get ready for Christmas? And I bake lots of cookies, so we have to bake. Oh my gosh, we still have so many things to do. My little girl isn't getting shorter. <coughs> but you know, John the Baptist tells us we need to prepare for Christmas, but we also need to prepare for when Jesus comes back to earth. Because, um, you know, he, he tells us that he's going to come back, but we don't know when that will be. So we need to get ready for that. And I was trying to think, I tried to make up a list of some things that I need to do to get ready for the day that Jesus comes back. And one thing is, I probably should go to church, right? Because we hear lots of good things here at church. And I need to help other people. I need to try to look around and find someone who needs help and help them. And just maybe that can be in the form of kindness to someone because some people don't have many kind people around them. They just need love and affection. And I, need, I know I need to pray more. I sometimes don't have time to do that. So that's one thing that I need to do. And this is a plug for next week. And go carefully. That's a great way to say <laughs> Share Christmas joy. And um, take time to be with friends and family. And to spend some time just in meditation with God. And to give to charities, maybe. And donate food. And just love everyone. I think that would be a list for us to try to strive for, to be ready for when Jesus comes back. Okay? Let's say a prayer. truth, you know, and, but that's really referring to the gospel as we know them. Um, so you don't really hear that word much except in church, so it's, it's a churchy word. Uh, but if you th every time you hear gospel, if you think of just good news, that is the literal translation of gospel, is good news. Now, every time that we hear good news, a lot of times we associate, well, why is why are we talking about good news? That sort of implies that there's some kind of bad news uh, there. And so, you know, we hear these good news, bad news scenarios uh, all the time. Uh, so the notion that these four books of the Bible that we call the gospel constitutes good news implies that there's a potential, at least, for some bad news somewhere. Uh, uh, because, after all, that's when we really need good news. Uh, is when there's been some bad news that's taken place. There's, it's like the doctor who took his, took his patient into the room and, and said, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. And, and the patient said, well, let me hear the good news first. And the doctor said, congratulations, you're going to be famous. We're going to name a new incurable disease after you. <laughs> Uh, or the story of Sam, who uh, phoned his wife up just for a chat, you know, and he called her, called her at work, and she said, well, you know, Sam, I'm, I'm really busy. I don't really have time to talk, so, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And Sam said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got some good news and bad news that I need to tell you. And, and uh, she said, I don't, uh, just tell me the good news, we'll talk about the bad news later. And he says, all right, uh, well, you know, um, the good news is that the airbags in our new car work perfectly. Goodbye. <laughs> anyway. The gospel bring, brings us good news because we need some good news. 
Jesus once said that he came so that we might have a full and meaningful life, a life with purpose. So why do we need good news? Well, it's because on our own, as human beings, we fall into sin. We do the wrong things. And sin, sin is what separates us from God. As a matter of fact, one of the, uh, I think, best definitions of sin is separation from God or separating ourselves from God. And, and the Bible says that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray at some times in our lives. That's the bad news. The good news is Jesus comes to save us, to save us from ourselves, to save us from our sins. The good news is that Jesus is bridging the gap, the separation between us and God. The bad news, we mess up as human beings. The good news, Jesus saves us. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now the Bible tells us in all four of the Gospels actually that, that this man named John the Baptist he came to prepare the way of the Lord. And last week if you were here in my message I talked about being ready for Jesus' coming and, and Joan in her message last week talked about Boy Scouts and about being prepared uh, the Boy Scout motto. Uh, so it is important that we are prepared and John the Baptist was the preparer of the way for Jesus. Verse 5 and 6 of our scripture reading this morning says that people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to see John the Baptist. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Now, as I read this and think about it, and we hear the same thing in all four of the Gospels, this always sounds a little odd to me. Why would people come from all over the place to see this admittedly unusual, strange kind of man? He is described as a wild man from the wilderness. And he looked, and I would imagine he probably even smelled kind of strange. But Jesus referred to John the Baptist as a prophet. Now that's significant at this time in history, and it also is quite a compliment, uh, because prophets, as we know, all throughout the Old Testament, they are those people who spoke boldly for God, on God's behalf. Prophets weren't afraid to say what it was that God was really thinking. Prophets were almost always politically incorrect in their day. And they were often, often issuing warnings of impending judgment that God was going to bring on God's people. And when John the Baptist shows up, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for almost 400 years. And then out of the blue comes this fellow, out into the desert near the Dead Sea, wearing a rough, dark camel hair coat, uh, which was really the garb of the poorest of the poor people of his time. And he was offering this provocative message. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And it really was a message of challenge and it was a message of hope for people of that time. You know, one reason I think that John got a lot of people's attention was because that he did live in the desert. And that was a wilderness area, a really tough area, where almost nobody lived out in the wilderness in the edge of the desert. But John called the desert home. And if we, if we listen to our other scripture passage from Isaiah this morning, uh, it made sense uh, that John lived in the desert because Isaiah, the prophet, uh, he said that there would be a, vo a voice of one crying out, Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. 
which is why Joan read from us from Isaiah 40 this morning. Another reason that, that John got people's attention, I think, was because he lived very simply. He was a very poor man. And most of the poor in Jesus' time ate fish and figs and maybe some barley loaves when they could get their hands on it. But John was so poor that it said what he ate were locusts. And honey, you know what a locust is? A cicada? Uh, you know, a little bug? You know, but that's what it said he ate. Uh, you know, and probably had to have a little hun honey on them to, to get them down. You know, to be able to eat those things and to get them down. That was his diet. Uh, and his appearance. His appearance told you what his lifestyle was like. He had those, those very poor clothes on. The poorest of the poor. The rags, that's what he was wearing. And he was, of course, unkempt. His hair was wild. He, he, he was dirty. Uh, he looked like the poorest of the poor, the poorest beggar you could find in his time. It was obvious that John could say, I'm not a part of, of the mainstream society. I'm not a part of the mainstream culture of this day. He could say, I'm nobody's pawn. I don't owe anything to anybody. Um, and I, so for that reason, I can tell you the truth straight up. Nobody's pulling my strings. Nobody's telling me what to do. These words are coming directly from God. And I'm going to tell you the truth about it. You know, when you have nothing, you don't have anything to lose. And John had nothing. And so he was out there preaching as a prophet. And people were going, wow, why is he saying these things? Obviously, no one's telling him to do this. He doesn't owe anything to anybody. And I think a third reason that John really got the people's attention is because this attire that he was wearing, this camel hair, old robe, was, was exactly the same type of robe that the prophet Elijah wore. That we read, we, you can read about in the Old Testament. Every Jew... Every Jew knew that before the Messiah was going to come, a prophet like Elijah is going to show up. He's going to be dressed sort of like Elijah, and he's going to be speaking like Elijah. And this was so the people would know that God was up to something, and he was getting ready, uh, uh, you know, to, to do, have a special pronouncement for the people that the Messiah would be coming. So John got the people's attention. There were various reasons that people would go and start to listen to him. And then as he became more and more famous, more and more people began to come and to listen to John. And it was amazing. The numbers that were baptized by John right there in the Jordan River. So what did John say to people? He had a very simple, very short message. He told people that they could do what they could do. To live a life that pleased God. And the first thing he said people need to do was repent. Repent of your sins. You know, we don't hear a lot of messages about repentance today. Here in the early 21st century. We hear a lot that God loves us. Which is true. But we also need to hear that we do need to repent. Which simply means that God expects us to follow him in our lives. God expects us to live a life that pleases God. And if we're not doing that, if we're heading down a path that's not pleasing to God, then repent. Repent simply means turn around. To turn around. Go in the other direction. Do something that is going to, to please God. And you know, this, this, this message of repentance seems very old school, really. Seems sort of like that's what a hellstone, hellfire and brimstone preacher was preaching. <laughs> it's repentance. You know, you have to repent. And it reminds me that, you know, that one day there was these, these two old country pastors. And they were out by the side of the road and they had these signs. They were holding, each, each one of them was holding up a sign. And one of the pastors, you know, uh, the sign said, the end is near. And the other pastor, He's holding up his sign, and he said, turn yourself around before it's too late. And a car sped right past him on the highway, and a driver leaned out of his window, and he yelled at these two old pastors, leave us alone, you religious nuts. 
and he just sped on down the road. And all of a sudden, he heard uh, tires squealing and, and, and a big splash. One pastor turned to the other and said, you think maybe we should just say, bridge is out? <laughs> but anyway, repent is rarely the message we want to hear. Because it means we're going in the wrong direction. If we need to repent, we're going the wrong way. And if we're headed in the wrong direction, we need to hear that message. We need to hear it. And that's what John said to us first and foremost, repent. Then if we look at verses 11 and 12 of this passage from Matthew 3 this morning, John the Baptist also says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who's coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to take off his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And of course, John is talking about Jesus uh, coming after him. John goes on to say, his winnowing shovel is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff, chaff he will burn up with fire that never goes out. So John's saying that, you know, hey, there are, there are some people like that. They're like the wheat because they bless and they feed others. And that's really what being a Matthew 25 church is all about. That's something we're going to hear a lot about in 2020, becoming a Matthew 25 church, um, where Jesus is saying, you know, you, you cared for me, you fed me, you clothed me. You tended to me when I was sick. Um, there are a lot of people that do that. There are a lot of people sitting right here that do that, actually. Um, but John says there are people also, however, that are like chaff. Um, now, the chaff, they look like wheat. They, they are in the same field as wheat. They grow up right along with the wheat. But in the end, chaff is useless. And Jesus tells us, and John is saying here, that God, God is going to sort out human lives. God is looking for and hoping to find people that are keepers. That's my turn, not God's. It's not God's will that anyone should live his or her life in such a way that they end up in some kind of spiritual trash can. But some people will. Some will. Because their lives offer absolutely nothing that God can use. They are the chaff. Or they're the goats, as described in Matthew 25, if you want to go look up that scripture again. So the question I think that, that John is causing all of us to think about and causing all of us to act, ask is, is my life going in the right direction? Is my life pleasing to God? And John says the kind of life that pleases God starts with repenting of your sins. The first thing John said was repent. Be honest with God. Be willing to take your sins to God and turn them over to God. Confess your sins. Tell about the places that you've messed up in your lives. And then John asked them to be baptized. And at this time, that wouldn't have been easy for people because confessing and baptizing were public acts. People were actually wading into the middle of this muddy Jordan River and while they were out there, they were publicly saying, uh, I, I'm a liar or I'm a thief or I've harmed someone right out there in the midst of all these other people and then they were dumped in this muddy river. Uh, it was a public act of confession and baptism. And back then, during this time, pretty much the only people that ever got baptized were, was the occasional pagan or non-Jew who wanted to convert to Judaism. Those were the only people that were baptized. It very rarely happened in the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. But John is saying to all people, including all Jews, guess what? You need to repent and you need to be baptized. In other words, you need to turn
turn your life around just as much as the wildest pagan needs to turn their life around to follow God's way as well. And then John said to them, you know, you've got, you've got to live for real. We start by repenting. Then, if we're going to live that life that pleases God, you have to get real with God and honest with God. We don't act like we're better than we are. We don't put on some kind of plastic face and come to church on Sunday mornings. We need to be real and open and honest with God. Because you know what? God knows our sins anyway. God knows our frailties. But John is saying, and Jesus says later on, you've got to turn those over to God. You've got to be real. You've got to be honest in your relationship with God. You know, I would love it. I would love it if people saw my life and thought, oh, that Pastor Steve, he's great, you know? Man, he, he's just great. But that's pride. And when pride gets mixed in with spirituality, things can get out of whack in our lives. So when I start believing in my own greatness, I'm lost. And I'm going in the wrong direction. And I'm not following the path that God is asking me to follow. So when John says, produce fruit consistent with repentance, he's saying, let your faith in God influence your life. That's what he's saying. Let your faith, your belief in God influence your life, influence what you're doing in your life, influence your actions on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's not trying to impress people. That's not trying to impress God, for that matter. We're simply allowing God to influence who we are and what we do. So what sort of actions is John talking about when he says that? Well, if you go to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and look at the third chapter there, um, I think there's a good answer for us. Um, Jesus is being questioned by the crowd there. And the crowd says to Jesus, what then should we do? And Jesus replies to them. And he says, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. Tax collectors came to Jesus to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? And Jesus told them, don't collect any more than what you've been authorized. Soldiers as well come to, came to Jesus and questioned him. and said, what should we do? And Jesus said, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation. Be satisfied with what you have. I think the bottom line answer that Jesus is saying to us and that John is saying to us is, you've got to act like God rules your life. That's the bottom line. Act like God is in control. Act like God rules your actions, your words, your behaviors. That means to treat people right. That means to be honest. That means to be generous. That means to look for opportunities to serve. That means to love God with more than just your words. Love God with the way you live your life. Finally, I want to remind you that John says here that the kingdom of heaven is near. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, in other words, is just as close as our asking God for forgiveness. A full and meaningful life lived with an eye on eternity, and not just on right now, is as close as turning to God and turning away from your own selfishness turning away from what you believe your path should be and following what God knows your path should be. So yeah, John the Baptist is right. The kingdom of God is near. It's always near. It's right here. We just have to turn to God and put our faith in God, put our lives in God's hand. You know, that's really the reason that Jesus came to remind us that the kingdom of God is near. It's right here for us because God is right here for God. And I think we need to 
remember that God loves us just as we are. You've heard that before, and I've said that many times. God loves us just as we are, but God loves us too much to leave us the way we are. He wants us to move ahead, to follow in the way and the truth. The good news, the, the bad news, let's go to the bad news. We're not perfect. We're sinners. We make mistakes. We err. We're human beings. The good news, by God's grace, we are saved through Jesus. Thanks be to God. Let us respond to our word this morning by rising either in body or in spirit and singing together our hymn of response, which is number 258 in your hymn. Shall we rise together and sing?
Oh God, in a joyous spirit, we offer our tokens to you this day. May they be used to bring a spirit of light to all people so that they may jump for joy in your kingdom. God, we know that when the, when the time was right and the hour had come, you sent your servant, John the Baptist, into the wilderness to proclaim the coming of the one true Messiah. Repent and be baptized, he said, for the salvation of God is at hand. John came to bear witness to the true light and Messiah, the Son of God. And John told them, wake up, watch, and wait, for the hour is near when the Son of God will rise. So our God, on the second Sunday of Advent, we have heard your servant crying out to us. We've heard this call to repentance and restoration, and we want to respond. We've heard that you're offering forgiveness of sins. And we want to hear your mercy spoken over us. We have heard that you're baptizing with all water and with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So our God cleanse us and make us new. We have heard that you are ushering in a reign of peace. And we want to see your kingdom. O oh God, our sins are many, but your mercy is great. O oh God, our vision is dim, but your coming is at hand. Our hope is feeble, but your promises stand forever. God, in our world is in need of you. Everywhere we look, we see need of you for your coming, for your restoration, for your peace, for your transformation in people's lives, especially in our lives. On this second Sunday of Advent, we pray for the nations to know your truth and to see your light. We pray for the poor. We pray for the hungry and for the needy. We pray for those who are spiritually hungry and poor in spirit. May they come to know your living water and to drink deeply from your well. We pray for those who have to face this Christmas alone. We pray for the sick and the homeless, for the destitute. And we especially lift up all those we have mentioned by name at the beginning of this service this day. We ask that you tend to them, our God. And those that we have not named but who we hold in our thoughts and in our prayers, be with them as well in their time of need. God, we know the hour of your coming draws near. Make us ready. Make us ready in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. Lord Jesus Christ, come to us again this Advent season. Come. Come and do not fail. Continue to be with us now, our God, as together we repeat that special prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Lord. Let us now rise one last time, either in body or in spirit, as we sing together our closing hymn, which is number 249 in your hymnal, O come, all ye faithful, shall we rise together and sing.
people to come and adore him and to follow in his way and his truth and his life. I hope you're having a joyful Advent season as you're preparing for Christmas this year. It's hard to believe it's already the second Sunday of Advent and we're moving close to the middle of December already. So many things going on, so many activities to be a part of. Uh, don't forget, you're invited to come out to the uh, special uh, viewing of the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Now, we're on 34th Street. Yeah, uh, said I was at We're on 34th Street uh, this Friday night, so come out and be a part of that. Uh, caroling uh, is coming up as well. Uh, on Sunday, so you're welcome to be a part of that. So many activities and things to be a part of during this Advent and Christmas season. Regardless of where you find yourself, regardless of what you're doing to prepare yourself for the coming of Christmas and the coming of the Christ child, remember that God, God is right there with you because God, God is always above us. God is always below us. God always goes right behind us. God always goes before us to show us the way. God always stands beside us to support us. And God is always inside us to bring us peace and joy. So go in peace this day, my friend. Amen.